Broadcasting from the Business Radio X studios, it's time for Business Leaders Radio. Now, here's your host, John Ray. And hello again, everyone. Welcome to another edition of Business Leaders Radio. I'm John Ray, and folks, this is going to be a great one. I've been looking forward to welcoming Ryan Kauf with us. Ryan is with Kauf & Associates. He's also the host of the Fractional Executive Podcast. Ryan, welcome. Thanks, John. Thanks for having me. Yeah, absolutely. Thanks for coming on. Um, let's Before we get into some of the details of how, how uh, uh, what you can share with us in terms of your work, let's talk about how you're serving uh, folks out there. Yeah, I mean, I primarily serve as a business coach for founders and family business owners. And what we work on is we work on getting them up from the current growth plateau that they're stuck on. And we move them up to that next step in their business's growth. So I'm primarily working with established owners of businesses, several years in existence, and they have some kind of challenge with one of five things or many of those five things mm -hmm. and the kind of company size because sometimes people ask me that question is i'm typically working with companies that are about half a million in revenue up to 10 million in revenue because i've found in my experience that companies of that size in revenue have fairly common uh growth challenges mm. yeah okay cool so um you have You've got an interesting background that I want to make sure people know about that you bring to the table here. You you were involved um, and have been involved for years. You founded the entrepreneurship program at the University of Wisconsin Green Bay. Talk about that. Yeah, um, you know when I was you know early on in my career. So first of all, that's where I went to undergrad. So mm -hmm. that kind of thing tugs at my heartstrings a bit. It was a great place for me, uh, you know, spent several years there, obviously, and it was a really good um, growth uh, place uh, for me professionally. Mm -hmm. um, you know, I got that first real job out of college um, about a year into that. And again, the company I was working for was fantastic, great family owned company. But about a year into it, I realized that that current role that I had was not what I wanted to do. Mm -hmm. Talk to some people that I knew um kind of went forward did a lot of reading i've read dozens hundreds of books um and what that did was it kind of got me into what i wanted to do next and what i did next was i started helping friends start businesses and then i got a referral and somebody paid me to do it which i thought was the best thing ever right and so i just kept doing that and that mm -hmm. was uh it was early on in in my career Mm -hmm. um, I went in, I went to get an MBA because I wanted to learn more about the accounting side of business. I thought that was kind of my weakness, but actually during that time, I met more people who then kind of focused me more on, uh, business coaching. Mm. Um, from there, I worked in, uh, community banks, uh, doing, uh, business financing. Um, but on my bucket list was always it would be really cool to teach a class at my undergraduate university so mm -hmm. the backup plan for the mba was a teaching credential essentially um i actually got a teaching job at a different university before my mba uh was over which was probably not i don't want to say that was not legal to do for them but you know i wasn't done with it yet uh but i had a really wise person tell me well if you want to teach a class at some point, why don't you just throw some resumes out and teach one now? And I mm. thought, well, that's not a bad idea. So about a year later, I got this first teaching job. I told my one of my advisors from my undergraduate university that I had this job. Mm -hmm. And he said, well, in fall, I have this administrative role that I'm that's going to be new for me. And I need to offload one of my classes. Do you want to teach it? And I was like, that's, that was my bucket list. Right. Yeah. So I did that. 
And then they didn't have anything else, any other openings. And I, I was really happy. I kind of checked it off the bucket list, but then I was kind of like, I really like doing that. I wonder if I could do it again. Taught at some other uh, universities as an adjunct. Um, and then I worked at the small business development center, uh, at UW green Bay mm. in that role. And again, kind of what I'm doing now, coaching and consulting with small business owners, uh, the associate Dean came into my office and said, you know, I've realized that a lot of the students here go and work in small businesses and we really don't have a class that teaches that. So it's kind of like your, your teaching pricing story, um, John, <laughs> very familiar, right? Right. So the same right. Thing. And so I developed this class and it filled up and then they put it out there kind of as this temporary experimental class and it filled up again. Um, a semester later, that same associate Dean came into my office and said, we are going to hire a full-time lecturer for entrepreneurship and this, these types of classes. Mm -hmm. I'm just telling you because I'm going to post it and it's going to close in 30 days. So I had a decision to make. I had some other opportunities that were really good, um, but I chose that one. And so mm. that then put me on a five year uh, trajectory of building this entrepreneurship program at my alma mater, which again was, is certainly one of the probably the most satisfying things I've ever done. That's awesome. What a great story. And um, yeah, and just to give uh, our audience context, before we came on, we were just talking about pricing, which is uh, a subject passionate, I'm passionate about, and and that only 9% of business schools in this country, last time I saw the stat, have a course, a course on pricing. And entrepreneurship is not that much better. I don't know what the stats are, but that is not that much better. And so kudos to that associate dean and all their uh, his uh, his her colleagues at uh, UW Green Bay for uh, seeing the light on that. K kudos to them for sure. Yeah, I agree. I mean, it's it's not often that it, in my experience that you know a student need comes forward and a business school makes a new hire you know, for, for that particular need. So I, right. Really yeah. Yeah. Good stuff. Well, let's get into your business coaching practice and, and, and let's just talk about the value of having a business coach. I mean, some of the businesses you're talking about, you, you, you're, you're in, in terms of size, half a million up, um, you may be the first business coach they've hired, right? I mean, uh, they haven't had one before. So talk about why they should have one and what, what makes a successful relationship? Yeah, that's a good point, John. I typically am. Um, once in a while, I will get referred in by another coach. Mm -hmm. So for example, um, it's pretty common for me to get referrals from executive coaches. Mm -hmm. um, you know, they're working with that particular business owner, but they're working, you know, on their own professional development, not on the development in the, in the organization right. um, itself. So, you know, my approach to business coaching might be a little bit different, mm -hmm. um, but essentially we talk about five different areas. Uh, we talk about marketing operations, financing, um, org culture, and then their own uh, executive leadership development. And when we talk about that, we talk specifically about them going from that functional executive, meaning they have an area of expertise, could be finance, could be marketing, could be sales, could be operations. Mm -hmm. um, but what they really need to do next is become more of a strategic, and I might even say visionary leader of their company. So they no longer have that functional role. And as many small business owners understand it, they're kind of a multiple fractional executive in their company, right? They're mm -hmm. running sales, they're running operations, they're, you know, they're running finance maybe even. And so they're kind of a, you know, again, they're a fractional executive in their company. It's really hard to let go of what they're good at mm -hmm. and move on to that next level of leadership in their company 
And really what I found out is that step is really the only way to grow to that next level. And so what I do is we have, we have an introductory conversation. Um, typically what I hear uh, today from some of these uh, founders, established founders and family business owners is basically kind of one of two things. It's typically um, my spouse or significant under, other can't stand me right now. I'm way too frustrated <laughs> and too hard to live with and things like that. We're not right. talking about like the D word. It's not, it's not that yeah. level, yeah. but it's kind of like, I don't really want to take a vacation with you right now. You know, that kind mm. of a, that kind of a thing. Cause it um, won't be a vacation, right? It won't be a vacation. Correct. Right. And, and right. again, speaking of vacations, that's kind of the test, right? The test is if you can take a week vacation out of the country mm. and you know, and you feel that your business isn't going to burn down while you're gone. That's kind of the test of you have now moved toward that next, you know, level of leadership. Yeah. Anyway. And the other thing I usually hear is that they're losing employees, um, even though there might even be an award winning company to work for. Um, and so when I'm trying to work with them, uh, we do one of two things. One is we figure out how we work together well. That's mm -hmm. a, that's a key part. And sometimes that takes a few months. Um, in addition to that, we start by tackling one of those five areas. And because we're, as humans, we're kind of linear thinkers and it's hard for us to think in 3D or 4D, mm. right? We start with one and obviously one of those then affects all the other ones. Um, and typically, guess which one they pick? They pick the one that they're the functional expert at. Sure. Um, and so that's, you know, to me, that's real satisfying. And we work weekly for a while. And then we go out to every two weeks, every month, and we keep progressing that way. I'm typically working with an established founder or family business owner for about a year. Yeah. Cool. Um, you know, I'm, I'm curious about... Um, one little aspect of what what you mentioned there, Ryan, if you if if you don't mind, what, do you think um, business owners are there? Are I mean, we always assume, right, that um, as advisors, that um, business owners aren't nearly um, they're just not where they need to be in terms of having a succession plan. Um, letting the business run without them, that kind of thing. At, to, to what extent have you been su surprised the other way on that, 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 that business owners have maybe have their act together a little bit more than what we advisors sometimes think? I'm just curious about that. Yeah. I mean, I'm glad you brought that up because if a business owner has a succession plan, they actually are on their way to being that strategic visionary executive. That's mm -hmm. one of the number one indicators for me. And it's one of the questions I actually ask in our initial call, because it gives me um, a hint at what they what their day to day is like. Right. Right. Is it mm -hmm. I'm putting out fires all the time or is it I can actually work in my functional role or is it a combination of all that? Plus, you know, I have a strategic plan. We do this every year. You know, I involve my key leaders as well as cross-functional uh, folks in the, in the business. So having that succession plan is so important because I think the stat is close to that 9% you were talking about, that businesses have succession only about 10% of the time. Now, if right. you're a family business, you almost start that family enterprise with that idea in mind. So typically I'm going to find a family business is going to have a succession plan. It might not be well-defined, might not be on paper quite right with other advisors, you know, giving input on that. Um, but a lot of business owners I find in the kind of annual revenue range that I'm working with uh, them on are typically thinking that their retirement is going to be selling their business. And if they're not intentional about that, their chances are, I think, lower than they think of that 
actually happening. And mm -hmm. quite frankly, if I drive by a business that I've known has been there for a while and I see their doors have closed and there's an article in the local paper about this business closed and that's just, and that's the end of the article. Mm -hmm. I mean, that saddens me. I missed an opportunity there to talk to them about, about that. Right. And if it's not me, they work with, you know, there are other resources out there um, that they can, that they can work with um, on those. And I'd much rather have a business stay in a community and have a succession plan um, and, and stay open, you know, mm -hmm. than, than not. Yeah, for sure. Folks, we're here chatting with Ryan Kalth. Ryan is with Kalth and Associates. He's also the host of the Fractional Executive Podcast. We'll talk about his podcast here uh, in a little bit. But you mentioned these five functional areas that you identify as um, key as you work with business owners. W w what five are those? And wh where do you see business owners? I mean, this is a general question and every everybody's got specific answers in their own circumstance but where do you see business owners in these five areas generally doing well and not so well yeah i mean if you're talking about marketing operations financing um organizational culture um which has to do a lot with um how they hire onboard retain develop their talent Mm -hmm. um, and then their own executive leadership development, again, going from functional to strategic. Um, most business owners are very good at operations. They've kind of figured it out and they've kind of, you know, that, that horrible analogy of we built the airplane as it's flying, which is impossible to do, but that's the analogy <laughs> we use, which I hate, but I haven't found yeah. another one that's, that's, that's good. Right. Um, they, they do that and they're good at that. Mm -hmm. uh, they might be really good negotiators on, you know, getting things, you know, cheaper than, you know, the average person, for example, mm -hmm. they yeah. might be really good at understanding, okay, here's how my business operates. I can even automate some of these processes, but typically they're still looking back and they're not being proactive. So what I mean by that is they're not thinking my business might triple in size, whether that's employees or revenue. And what I really should be doing with my operations is setting it up for success in the near future and even the distant future. Mm. It's really what works now. And the problem they usually come up, come to is my customers have changed. And so when you think about COVID and how all of us changed as customers and buyers and patients and guests and whatever term we want to use for uh, the folks that buy from us, um, you know, just using that example alone, most people can relate to that. Yeah, my operations had to completely change because people did this during COVID and then they expected to still have that post COVID, mm -hmm. right? Right. Um, and so, you know, there were a lot of really busy web development and e-commerce development companies during that time, mm -hmm. right? Sure. If we don't have order online now, we better get it in the next few weeks. You know, that, you know, that kind of thing. Right. Um, most business owners have a good handle on part of their marketing. So, for example, they might be very good at sales or they might be very good at business development, which is kind of a mix of sales, networking um, and things like that. They might be really good at going to the trade shows and getting leads there. But what they're not typically good at is really understanding proactively how their customers are going to change and buy from them. Mm. So in with the customers that I, the clients I work with, they are typically told, I would buy more from you if you could sell me more. And so besides the frustrating spouse and the employees leaving, that's number three that I usually get is, you know, I can't figure out how to produce more because my clients really want to buy more from us and i'm on this plateau of no growth and i need to get to the next level so i can serve more customers mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. so you i can see how you come in with a um client and you've got these five functional areas that cover the entire company these are big picture um 
things with, with a lot of details that are involved, a lot of different tactics that are involved in each of these five. How do you prioritize? I mean, how do you, how do you, uh, have a conversation with that business owner around, um, Cause I can see how they might get overwhelmed <laughs> when, yeah, yeah right. when you, when you come in and start talking about some of the things that might need to be done, how do you prioritize and keep a business owner from feeling that overwhelm? There's, there's two, there's two approaches to that. One is we start with one of those areas. Mm -hmm. And again, knowing that that one area we're going to choose to start with is going to affect all the other ones, which is kind of the good news, you know, as mm -hmm. we're working on financing your growth, Mm -hmm. It also is going to help other areas, you know, uh, other areas that we will then touch on later on. Right. The second one is, you know, I have to build trust with that client really quickly because they have to trust me and trust this process. And if I can't do that, if I fail to do that, then that working relationship with the client and myself is really going to struggle for the first few weeks, if not the first few months. Mm -hmm. Now, some of that is natural. I need to understand how my client wants to be communicated with. And then the next step is how do we best communicate together? Mm -hmm. um, but that's how I try to decrease the overwhelm because they're already overwhelmed by the frustration and you know, their significant other not wanting to go on vacation with them and they're losing employees. I mean, that's that's frustrating in itself. Right. Besides, my company is not growing and I just know it can because my customers are telling me they'll buy more from me. Mm hmm. Yeah. What strikes me about uh, uh, what you're identifying is reasons why someone needs to call you, <laughs> you know, the, the spouse wants to go on a, a real vacation or, you know, employees are leaving. Um, these are intangibles, right? I mean, th this is not like, oh, my profits went down 10% or, or, you know, whatever. I mean, this, this is, these are intangibles that executives, business owners have identi identified as tipping points where they need something different. Yeah, you know, you would think, I guess, kind of intuitively that if someone's profits were decreasing um, or, uh, you know, there was some kind of uh, problem going on on that profit and loss statement for that business, mm -hmm. that they would make a call to a coach or their CPA or some kind of advisor. But what I typically find is they don't do that. Right. Right. Um, and I'm not saying they call me when it's too late. It's certainly, I would say, virtually never too late. Um, but what I find is that when it's affecting them personally and affecting their family and affecting their friends um, and, you know, they, you know, going to the gym doesn't work anymore, you know, to decrease their stress level. Um, that's typically when I get a call or a referral. Mm -hmm. um, I would much rather have you know, the, the proactive one where it's, um, you know, my customers are telling me they'll buy more for me. That means I can grow, but I haven't really set my company up to be successful at that level. Um, but typically that's not when I get the call. Right. Um, there's some sort of smoke from fire somewhere, right? Um, uh, <laughs> right. Oh, uh, yeah, that, that, uh, that makes sense. So you have, you've been the, the client here along the way as it were, right? So you've Absolutely. hired business, business coaches. Um, uh, so you, you, you've been willing to take that medicine that you, that you prescribed today. Talk about your, your experience uh, with that, what, what you gained from that and therefore why you're so passionate about why business owners ought to hire you as a coach. Yeah. I mean, first of all, I think one of the best coaches I ever had was my seventh and eighth grade basketball coach. Cause I am not a good basketball player. I mean, mm. the most points I ever scored in a game was eight, mm. right? I mean, that's not good, but he would put me in on defense. Um, and he was, he was really good at understanding the strengths of his players and 
kind of pulling that competency out of them. Mm -hmm. So for example, I could probably coach a seventh and eighth grade basketball team right now on the two full court press break plays that he taught me as well as his entire set of offensive plays. Mm. Like I remember him that much, right? And I'm not in seventh or eighth grade anymore. <laughs> right? But the first professional coach I had, I hired and I learned one thing and I spent five figures to do it. It's the one thing was focus. That's what she taught me. That was it. That was the lesson. And obviously I've never forgotten that. Periodically throughout my career, I've hired coaches and it was typically, again, trying to proactively say, okay, I have a new position. Um, I'm doing something different now. And there's one coach I actually hired twice at both of those, both of those levels, because even though I'm a coach, I also need coaching. I like mm. to think I'm a coachable, teachable guy. Mm. Um, I'm sure like all my clients, I kind of struggle with some of those things and I know I have, um, but I feel it's that important, um, that, you know, I, I need to do that. And in fact, I would say my current coach, uh, I work with now, uh, coaches me on my podcast and how to do a podcast and, um, how to make it interesting, you know, and mm -hmm. things like that. Yeah. Yeah. That's, that's. And you're never too big for this, folks. I mean, I, I, and if you don't mind, I just finished um, Bernie Marcus's book, Kick Up Some Dust, and he talks about his friendship with Sam Walton, the founder of uh, Bernie Marcus, co-founder of Home Depot, for mm -hmm. those that don't know. Um, his, his, he talks about his friendship with Sam Walton, who founded Walmart, and that the two of them used to walk uh, do walk arounds in each other's stores. They pick a market, they go to, you know, let's call it Milwaukee. Right. And, yeah. and would walk around each other's stores and, and point out to each other, you know, what they saw that needed to be improved. Um, these are men with fortune 500 companies and boards of directors that are supposed to be doing things like this. Right. Yet they saw value in having a coach. Yeah, absolutely. Um, and I think, you know, entrepreneurs learn best from other entrepreneurs mm -hmm. um, without question. The research points to that as well. And I used to tell the students in my entrepreneurship classes that, you know, don't don't tell my don't tell my boss this, but you're going to learn more from each other in this class and you're going to learn from me. Yeah. And that's how it's going to be as you you know progress throughout your career whether you are an employee throughout your career or you bounce back between employee and entrepreneur, or you're purely going to be an entrepreneur for your career. It's always going to be learning the most from other entrepreneurs and kind of others who have gone on before you. Mm, yeah, for sure. Well, you mentioned your podcast. Let's, let's get to that as we, um, uh, get down to closing the show. Um, you, you just started here, uh, a little bit ago, the Fractional Executive Podcast. Uh, talk about what that's all about. The, so the Fractional Executive Podcast is for those established founders and family business owners, as we've been talking about today, who are stuck on their current uh, plateau, right? They're not growing, they're frustrated. And so what I decided to do was kind of reflective on how I've approached coaching is you know, I'm, I'm a coach, but I also pull in other resources for my clients and point them to other resources. And so what I wanted to do was bring on expert founders who have had a functional area like a COO or a CMO, and they've had to go through that process of becoming a strategic CEO of their company, but they're also still good at that functional role talk about a little bit about their journey, mm -hmm. a little bit about their expertise and how that can help uh, these established founders and family business owners. Mm -hmm. And then we let them get, in, you know, give them their contact information. Um, and so listeners and viewers can contact them if they think they can be um, of help. That sounds pretty awesome. Uh, the great uh, show with a lot of 
value there. Let's direct our viewers, listeners to where they can go to, to uh, learn more about that. Maybe subscribe to the show. Yeah, the Fractional Executive Podcast is on all the podcast you know sites you would think of: uh, mm -hmm. YouTube, Spotify, uh, Apple, iHeart, TuneIn, um, and I know there's others that uh, that the team is working on. Um, and you can get a hold of me at my website, which is RyanCouth.coach. Mm -hmm. um, I'm also pretty active on LinkedIn if you want to connect with me there. Um, but yeah, I would I would love to love to talk to you. Yeah, well, before one more question before I let you go, because I, sure. I I, I want to make sure that uh, I always like to give uh, successful entrepreneurs, business leaders like you a chance to talk about a success story. Um, maybe a, a, a client who comes to mind who you you affected some significant transformation for. They got to go on a real vacations by the time you got done with them. They did. Um, I think probably one of my favorites was actually early on in my in my coaching career uh, when there was a kind of a smaller town service provider. They also uh, sold products mm -hmm. um, that aligned with what they did. Um, but there was an opportunity where they found out that the larger city, about 30 minutes away, clients were coming to them from that larger city. Mm. And so the decision was, should we open a second location in this larger city about half an hour away? The business owner kind of surveyed his really good employees. And again, he had great employees and none of them wanted to be like the one, you know, going down there. So mm -hmm. I helped him basically set up that second location. I've driven by it. You know, uh, when I go to that larger town, it's still there. Mm -hmm. Um, and so that was a really fun process for me because it was me actually kind of boots on the ground coaching, mm -hmm. which is a little different and it is something that I do. Um, but we set that second location up for success. We launched a big event to get people to, uh, to that area, uh, did a little radio on it, which was, which was fun for me. Um, and then after that, after that year, we had that set up and established and it moved forward. And again, it's, it's still there. Wow. What a great story. Um, folks, uh, I can't imagine again, there aren't some folks that would like to, uh, be in touch. So, uh, let, let's, let's re, re, uh, uh, repeat that con contact information that you gave Ryan. Sure. Uh, my website is ryankauf.coach or connect with me on LinkedIn. Terrific. Ryan Kauf, Kauf and Associates. He's also the host of the Fractional Executive Podcast. Ryan Kauf, thank you so much for coming on Business Leaders Radio. John, I really appreciate it. Thank you. Yeah, yeah thank you. Hey, folks, just a quick reminder as we wrap up here. Um, I've got a new book coming out here later this year in 2023. It's called the Price and Value Journey, Raising Your Confidence, Your Value, and Your Prices Using the Generosity Mindset Method. If you want to know more about the book, get updates about uh, its release um, expected in the fall of 2023, go to pricevaluejourney.com. You can sign up for to receive updates there. Um, and also my podcast of the same name, The Price and Value Journey. Um, so, uh, uh, feel free to, to uh, connect with me there, and uh, I appreciate you doing that. And I'm also thankful to our listeners. You, know, you make this show go, and we're grateful to you. If you've heard something here from Ryan that makes you think, hey, that uh, person I know, that colleague, the, a friend of mine that's a business owner needs to hear this message, uh, please share the show. That's how we help fulfill our mission as the voice of business uh, at Business Radio X. So for my guest, Ryan Kauf, I'm John Ray. Join us next time here on Business Leaders Radio. 